Hazards and safety consideration in hydrocarbon processing units. I would request uh, Mr. Uh, Shushantoda, could you please share your screen in between? Shushantoda, are you, are, can you hear me? Shushantoda, yeah, you're on mute. Uh -huh. Yeah, could you please share your screen by that time? Okay, let me continue. Today's topic is uh, hazards and safety consideration in hydrocarbon processing units. The session will be uh, presented by Mr. Sushanto Shaha. He is our alumnus with entry year 1987, currently working as GM in IOCL Barauni. Myself, Buddha Ditta, will be moderator for this session. My entry year to applied physics is 2002 and passing out in 2005. After passing out, I worked in various organizations like Tata Chemicals, Linde, LNT, Petrofac, CNPC in India as well as in Middle East. Currently working with NPCC Abu Dhabi in oil and gas projects for offshore fields. Now, to introduce uh, Sushan Tuda, he is a scholar from uh, starting from his school life he is student of ex student of Calcutta Boys School. He did his physics honors from Scottish Church College, Kolkata, and he uh, did BTEC in instrumentation from our applied physics department, Science Krajavada Science College. He also done MBA from MS University, Vadodara. Now coming to his career and experience, he started his career with Rockwell Automation in in engineering execution and commissioning of CNI packet for Tata Cement Plant in MP. Now, he joined uh, uh, after that Indian Oil Corporation. He is, he is having experience of commissioning the first hydrocracker unit in India, commissioning of captive power plant with utilities, with GT, HRSG, DM water plant is also there in his portfolio, commissioning of AU, DHDS, SRU, new loading gantry automation, uh, is, is is there in his experience engineering execution commissioning of lpg bottling uh, installation msq agu lpg storage plant he also did some revamp project of S A fcc <coughs> abus and lpg tubes indigenous technology based grassroots units like otamax dhdt execution and commissioning of dcu cgot LG LPGT is also there in his portfolio and execution of commissioning of first wet sulfuric acid plant in India came with his uh, in, is there in your in his career as well. Now coming to the uh, coming to the importance of safety uh, for the oil and gas and hydrocarbon projects in uh, in in uh, I mean safety requirements in hydrocarbon and oil and gas project that is the most important aspect to take care because the because the fluid which is being handled 
is highly flammable flammable and can lead to explosion resulting in catastrophes once a fire triangle we know all of us we know fire triangle so if once a fire fire triangle is complete it may lead to huge loss of human lives and properties now coming to the today's topic it will it will cover type of hazards the type of hazards may come from liquid gas toxic as toxic chemicals poisons radioactive materials as well as from fire up also now coming to the safety concept it will it will it will cover the presentation will cover the zone classification zone classification zone 0 1 2 identification of ignition sources then intrinsic con energy concept seal concept and different operating procedures it will it will also give a overview and idea uh, towards the approach to the prevention protection and mitigation and finally it will it will give uh, the idea of application of instrumentation engineering in prevention of protection of hazards in oil and gas and hydrochemical plants now i would like to uh, take the stage chushant uh, to the to take us through the whole presentation thank you audience uh, let chushant to the uh, continue the next part of the session thank you buda dito for the nice introduction which you have given and uh, let me continue with the presentation as buda dito has said that the main topics which i'll be covering uh, to explain the hazards and safety considerations in hydrocarbon processing units in the hydrocarbon industry will be the types of hazards which are faced in the hydrocarbon industry the safety concepts which are applied to mitigate those hazards the approach towards prevention protection and mitigation of the hazards and finally the application of instrumentation in prevention and protection of the hazards now you see in the hydrocarbon industry you have to deal with various types of hazardous fluids the main product the services which we deal with are liquid hydrocarbons gaseous hydrocarbons and these are the main feed which comes into the plant in the form of crude oil and then it gets further broken down and further filtered and refined into various hydrocarbon products all of these are mainly carbon and hydrogen compounds and all of these are hazardous in nature in addition to hydrocarbons hydrogen is used as a utility to hydrogenation in different units and other than hydrogen and hydrocarbons we have got toxic gases corrosive chemicals poisonous chemicals and radioactive substances which are used in the hydrocarbon industry some of the hydrocarbon and other chemicals toxic chemicals which are used in the hydrocarbon industry i have given a sample here as you can see uh, in a one of our plants in dhds block the type of chemicals which are used as you can see there are various toxic and various poisonous chemicals which are in use like antioxidants ammonia ethylene glycol corrosion inhibitors freon hydrazine morpholin and trisodium phosphates and hydrogen chloride other than these we have to deal with acids like hydrochloric acid sulfuric acids hydrogen sulfide gases all of which are very toxic and poisonous in nature now what are the incidence of hazards where it can happen in a hydrocarbon processing plant from the very start where the feed and the chemicals which are used in the hydrocarbon processing they are being received in various tankages then intermediate storage and then processing of this hydrocarbon there is a mother plant where they are processed in a distillation column from the distillation column this goes to different secondary processing units the cracking units where the hydrocarbon is further cracked down into smaller compounds the processing and handling of these hydrocarbons the transportation from one unit to another and then finally into the final storage tanks and then dispatch of the products through truck loading wagon loading and pipeline in each and every stage we are faced with hazardous product handling which can if not handled properly can give a rise to a fire incident or a serious toxic gas leakage incident now this is a uh, very uh, very very familiar to us and those who are in, in the hydrocarbon industry they have dealt the fire triangle 
basically what can cause a fire a combination of air and fuel if that is that finds the source of ignition in terms of heat it will cause a fire a combustible substance along with oxygen and the products of combustion if they find a source of ignition energy and it rises to a sufficient temperature flammable temperature it will give rise to a fire this fire triangle can be further extended specifically for hydrocarbon industry in terms of a tetrahedron in a tetrahedron a fourth component is added which is known as a chain reaction as you can see in this tetrahedron there is a green triangle which explains the chain reaction now in case of a hydrocarbon processing unit uh, the fuel or any feed along with oxygen if it comes in contact with oxygen inside a pipeline or inside a column and while during its reaction sufficient heat is produced it can give a rise to fire now the fire could get mitigated if action is taken immediately but if the fire is followed by a chain reaction in the hydrocarbon compounds which can further enhance the fire into spreading into different vessels and different columns inside the plant resulting in a major fire incident now what could give rise to this hydrocarbon fire the four most important points of this are flash point auto ignition of temperature pyrophoric ignition and flammable of explosive limits each of these have a set temperature beyond which if the temperature rises it will give rise to fire if the if a hydrocarbon reaches above its flash point which is generally 19 26 to 2315 degrees celsius it will cause auto ignition auto ignition means it does not needs a separate heat source by itself it will auto ignite when it comes in contact with oxygen pyrophoric materials like iron compounds if they are formed inside a pipeline that can also give rise to a toxic incident the hydrocarbon products are classified in terms of three classes class a class b and class c in terms of degrees of hazards class a product is the most hazardous as you can see the flash point of a class a product is between 23 degrees celsius or below class a products if they come in contact of oxygen even at ambient temperature which is normally in case of india it's around 30 to 32 degrees celsius it will cause ignition so tanks which contain class a products have to be hermetically sealed and one has to be very careful so that the product does not come out of the tanks class b and class c as in comparison are much less hazardous as they are much less flammable because they require a higher degree of temperature to catch fire now we can talk about different concept we have seen the fire triangle now if we go further a little more detail we can think of a process safety incident when can a process safety incident happen if you see at the bottom of the pyramid there is a factor called unsafe behaviors or insufficient operating discipline in case of a process plant if the operators do not follow the laid down procedures the sops the management of changes they do not follow the work permit system the integrity of the plant gets compromised whenever the integrity of the plant gets compromised because of unsafe behaviors it could give rise to certain system failures as you see we go to the next step in the pyramid will give rise to a system called a near miss what is a near miss a near miss is an event which has got a potential to give rise to a major consequence which can again lead to a event now such near misses if they continuously happen because of unsafe behaviors they will give rise to a minor consequence incident and minor consequence incidents if not taken care in time and a containment procedure is followed it will give rise to a major process safety incident a major process safety incident is when a fire or an explosion happens 
there is a major toxic release of gases which can lead to fatality serious injuries significant plant damage and damage to the environment in and around a hydrocarbon installation to explain this situation i have will go through a small safety video on this of an actual incident which has happened in one of the refineries just take me a few minutes to set it up are you there can you uh, give me some technical help <coughs> yes yes sir so you have to go to the settings menu settings yeah, yeah. i think uh, the from... settings have already allowed isn't it yeah in that google meet platform okay from that triple dot yeah, sign yeah. you have to choose the settings the last option and then uh, right. on the mic got it The Chevron Richmond refinery lies approximately 10 miles northeast of San Francisco in California's Contra Costa County. The 2900-acre facility was initially established in 1902 and primarily makes transportation fuels such as gasoline and diesel as well as lube oils. The refinery can process up to 250,000 barrels of crude oil per day. The first step of the refining process takes place in the crude unit. where crude oil is cleaned and heated before entering the distillation tower inside the tower the crude oil is boiled the vapor then condenses into various liquid hydrocarbon fractions or streams including jet fuel diesel and gas oil the different streams exit the distillation tower through separate pipes or side cuts that lead to other sections of the refinery on august 6 2012 The crude unit was operating normally. Around 3:50 that afternoon, an operator was performing a routine check when he noticed a small puddle on the ground near the distillation tower. The liquid appeared to be dripping from an 8-inch insulated pipe 14 feet overhead. The leaking pipe was a section of the tower's number 4 side cut line, which operated at a temperature of 640 degrees Fahrenheit. and contained light gas oil a combustible liquid similar to diesel fuel chevron inspectors knew that over the years the walls of the number 4 side cut had thinned due to corrosion but they did not realize how close this particular segment was to failure there was no shut off valve between the pipe and the distillation tower and no way to isolate the leak the head operator was called to the scene Although he believed the situation was serious, he did not believe the small leak warranted immediately shutting down the unit and stopping production. Following Chevron's standard practice for responding to hazardous leaks, refinery firefighters were sent to the scene. A number of managers, engineers, and technicians gathered there informally to assess the problem. The group discussed a recommendation from an operator to shut down the unit. But they decided to first try to pinpoint the leak by removing insulation from the pipe while the crude unit was still running. They hoped they could stop the leak with a temporary metal fitting known as a clamp. A Chevron firefighter tried using a pike pole to hook and pull away the insulation. But this poking action was deemed too dangerous because it was moving the pipe. The CSB later found that the tip of the pike likely caused a small puncture in the already thinned pipe. As the unit continued to operate, workers assembled scaffolding directly beneath the leaking pipe. 
Two firefighters then used a hook to remove the insulation from the pipe. As they were working, hydrocarbon vapor began to flow out from underneath the insulation. The two firefighters backed away from the growing vapor cloud. As the hot vapor mixed with air, it ignited. That fire was quickly put out, and the two firefighters immediately climbed down off the scaffolding. But the exact location of the leak was still obscured by the remaining insulation and firefighting water. So the Chevron firefighters attempted to strip the insulation off the pipe with high pressure water. But the leak suddenly worsened and hot hydrocarbon liquid started to spray out of the pipe. A decision was finally made to begin an emergency shutdown of the crude unit, but it was too late. Suddenly, the pipe ripped open. A vapor cloud formed and rapidly expanded as the large inventory of hydrocarbons in the distillation tower started to vent through the ruptured pipe. The vapor cloud immediately spread over hundreds of feet, engulfing all 19 people who had gathered nearby. The firefighters and operators struggled to escape through the dense hydrocarbon cloud, unable to see. They had to feel their way out some on their hands and knees. At approximately 6.30 p.m., two minutes after the huge vapor cloud formed, the hydrocarbons ignited. One firefighter was trapped inside a fire engine when it was suddenly engulfed in flames. He radioed for help. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is 460. But when he received no response, he assumed everyone else was dead. To escape the inferno, he fled through what witnesses described as a wall of fire. Fortunately, all the workers would eventually flee to safety, and there were no fatalities. The towering white vapor cloud could be seen as far away as San Francisco on the unusually clear August day. After the ignition, a dense plume of black smoke formed and drifted away from the refinery. The fire continued burning for hours. Over the succeeding days, more than 15,000 people sought medical treatment at nearby hospitals for breathing problems and other symptoms. During its investigation, the CSB determined that the carbon steel pipe installed in 1976 had thinned to the point of failure from an effect known as sulfidation corrosion. Carbon steel piping is particularly susceptible to this type of corrosion which occurs over time when the steel is exposed to sulfur-containing hydrocarbons at high temperatures. Steel piping that happens to be low in the element silicon corrodes especially quickly. The CSB learned that sulfidation corrosion had caused a major So I am stopping the video here. As you have seen, I hope I am audible now again. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, right. So uh, I have uh, stopped the video uh, midway to explain that as you have seen, what I was explaining that uh, uh, in the video, the in this refinery, in this case, it's a, it's a Chevron refinery. The reason for which that the fire took place was that the pipes were not inspected at the right time. It's a carbon steel pipe. It was required to be replaced with higher metallurgy alloy steel piping to prevent the corrosion from sulfur, which is present in the hydrocarbon. This was found in one of the Chevron refineries earlier also in Kuta before this fire took place. Even then they neglected it. It was forward, forwarded to this refinery. There they neglected and finally it resulted in a fire. So what I mean to say is, as we can see from the previous triangle where we discussed the process safety incident, a process safety incident is in the making from a very early stage. So these sort of things like, like near misses, if they're not taken care in time, could result in a 
मेजर सेफ्टी इंसिडेंट so proceeding to the next part as we go forward there is a method of differentiating in terms of zone there is a zonal concept to describe the type of hazardous regions which are present in a hydrothermal process unit it can be divided into three zones zone 0 zone 1 and zone 2 in case of zone 0 wherever hydrocarbon vapors are present in continuous basis say in case of closed containers you see this uh, there is a diagram here uh, where a tanker is shown unloading hydrocarbon product into a submerged tank uh, this is the method by which hydrocarbon is unloaded in case of petrol pumps so they have a submerged tank and the tanker comes and the pipe is fitted with which in the submerged tank the petrol or diesel is unloaded the submerged tank as you can see is having a liquid with a vapor on top of the liquid which is in a continuous hydrocarbon atmosphere and this is termed as zone 0 this is the highest hazardous atmosphere just outside of the tank and beyond the tanker is the zone 1 zone 1 is a slightly less hazardous place where you can have occasionally hydrocarbon vapor which is present in normal operation and zone 2 is further less hazardous the distance which is taken between zone 1 and zone 2 as per international standards is around 16 meters 16 meters from zone 1 zone 2 starts and 16 meters from zone 2 is the safe area as you can see the the white portion here this is the safe area so how do you differentiate in, in case of hydrocarbon processing plants the tank the tank is a storage tank rooftops they are termed as zone 0 because hydrocarbon vapor is continuously present there whereas the main processing units just outside the columns vessels there could be intermittent presence of hydrocarbons those are termed as zone 1 area and zone 2 is where normally hydrocarbon is not present say in case of dm plant in case of tps deaerators in case of effluent treatment plants the next concept which we will discuss is the concept of intrinsic safety now the concept of intrinsic safety is basically defined as the method used for reducing risk of ignition by minimizing the energy level needed to cause ignition and spark what are the identification of ignition source it could be the hot surfaces the flames of hot gases mechanically generated sparks electrostatic discharges and electrical installations you see the table on the right side here intrinsic safety devices are defined internationally in terms of gas groups there are three types of gas groups perhaps gas group 2a 2b and 2c 2a is basically acetone methane propane ammonia these are covered under group 2a group 2b covers hydrogen cyanide and 2c is hydrogen here again if you see in terms of the most hazardous it is group 2c which is hydrogen and 2a 2b is comparatively is less hazardous Now, in intrinsic safety, basically, in intrinsic safety, the philosophy is one has to find what is the source of ignition, and whatever electrical devices which are being used in a plant for control and automation, 
the current which is being carried in the field in those devices the current is limited or the voltage is limited or the power is limited to prevent and fire to happen in some cases say a device which might have a storage area in terms of battery here the limitation of energy is done by limitation of inductance or capacitance these four basic criteria are used for designing intrinsically safe devices another concept we are going to talk about here we have talked about the three different zones of where how we have divided the zone the hazardous areas into different zones the next we have talked about intrinsic safety which is a method of limiting the energy which goes out into the field devices another form of preventive explosion is by having an explosion protection enclosure the here instead of limiting the energy the enclosure which is covering the devices that itself is termed as an explosive protection device what do you mean by that we have got three different criteria here exd exc and exm these are the three different methods by which the explosion can be contained within the device and not allowed to come out say a device is there say in terms of a positioner or a junction box which is there in the hazardous area outside in the plant now a positioner can be intrinsically safe if it is intrinsically safe the energy which is going there is limited below such a level that even if there is some gas present it won't cause any ignition or fire what is an alternate to that we can have a enclosure which is covering the device so even if there is a hydrocarbon gas present there and a fire happens it will contain within that enclosure not allowing it to spread outside so this is done by a flame proof enclosure which is exd the next level of enclosure is increased safety these are normally used in motors in case of instrumentation we normally go for flame proof enclosure we do not use increased safety and the other method is encapsulation which is an exm enclosure encapsulation is used in devices like pressure switches which are hermetically sealed the third type of protection which we can give our devices to prevent any fire from happening is a poised and pressurized enclosure now what is a poised and pressurized enclosure say in case of a analyzer the analyzer unit is normally contains an analyzer it contains its components and it contains junction boxes these are housed inside a single panel the panel is kept fully purged with nitrogen nitrogen is introduced inside the panel purging is done to clean the panel from the inside and then it is pressurized with nitrogen to a pressure which is just above the pressure outside this prevents any hydrocarbon gas even if it is present outside to enter into the panel or cause any explosion the basic components which are used are pressure transducer switch flow sensor timer and a control system which controls this the control system can be pneumatic or electronic pneumatic control system in this case has got an advantage that the components will not get damaged in case of a fire but the disadvantage is they are not settable from a remote position you cannot normally set even from the control room or you cannot have a control with a connection with a plc or a control system from which you can switch off the system normally what happens in case of a pressure pressurized enclosure if they lose the 
pressurization there is an auto cut off system the power is cut off totally isolated so that the to- the main reason for a fire happening is taken out from the system some other concepts related with hazards and fire are fail safe and fire safe what is a fail safe system in case of a fail safe system even when there is an event or a failure the system or device which if it is fail safe it will fail in a way in which it will cause no harm or give rise to any dangerous hazard it will go to a safe state this is done basically let me give two or three examples like we normally have a relay if it is giving a output to a solenoid valve in the field the relay is always designed to deenergize to trip under normal case it stays energized in case of a running plant if there is a alarm then the relay will deenergize causing it to trip so this is a fail safe system so it even if there is a wire cut it will cause the system to go to a safe state it will immediately cause the whole system to shut down fire safe is a concept which is normally used in case of valves the valves which are used in hydrocarbon industries they are in hydrocarbon pipelines now if there is a leak from the valve from the stem it, the hydrocarbon will come out from the stem and it can cause a fire which could damage the valve itself if the valve gets damaged that will give rise to a complete rupture of the pipeline which will result in a major fire incident so here what is done is that the valves are specially designed to make them fire safe the components which are used to make them fire safe does not allow any possibility of hydrocarbon getting leaked out of the valves and thus preventing any explosion to happen now let us talk about what are the safety concepts which are used specifically in terms of instrumentation in hydrocarbon industries this table as you can see here it takes care of iec 61508 is the sort of a granddaddy of functional safety 61508 standard describes everything about functional safety which covers all the industries Now six one five zero eight does not. It's a generic in nature. For specific standards which cover particular hydrocarbon, as you can see, IEC six one five one one is a specific standard which is followed. And other than that, there are five zero one five six, six one five one three, and six two one zero nine. these are all covering the energy industry what we use generally is a combination of 61508 and 61511 61511 is specifically covering the logic solvers the programmable logic controllers how they are designed and 61508 covers the complete system iec 61508 is a basic standard from which the concept of safety integrity level has developed safety integrity level or sit as it is generally known in the whole industry safety integrity level is a level according to 61508 which describes the integrity of a safety integrity function seal can be defined in four different levels seal 1 seal 2 seal 3 seal 4 as you can see from this table just see in this table there is a low demand mode and a high demand mode let us uh, concentrate on the low demand mode which talks about average probability of failure on demand this specifically thing speaks of the devices which are used for designing an instrumentation system in a hydrocarbon industry the average probability of failure on demand is calculated 
and if that falls between 10 minus 1 to 10 minus 2 it is cell 1 and as you can see go down from cell 2 it is 10 minus 2 to 10 minus 3 and cell 3 is 10 minus 3 to 10 minus 4. So what does it tell us? The average probability of failure on demand that will go down as we go up in the seal ladder. So seal 2 devices are better than seal 1 devices so far as average probability of failure is concerned. The chances of failure is much less of seal 2 devices compared to seal 1 devices. And seal 3 devices is again, it is much, much, much lower the average probability of failure on demand and sealed food is the highest level. Now coming to this table here, this diagram, just watch this carefully. There are four particular compartments, the consequence of hazardous event, frequency of exposure, possibility of avoiding hazardous event, and probability of unwanted occurrence. I'd like you to concentrate on the first compartments C1 and C2. Just check C2. C2 is, as you can see, is basically, it's defined as severe irreversible injury or death of a person or temporary serious harm in case of hazardous event. In case of a severe injury or death which can occur, If it is connected with frequency of exposure, if the frequency of exposure is on a continuous basis, which is F2, and combined to that, the possibility of avoiding hazardous event is P2, that is it cannot be avoided, hardly possible. If we define a hazardous event which can cause severe bodily harm, injury, the frequency is high, it is continuous stay in a hazardous area and if it cannot be aborted, a combination of all these three will give rise of a probability of unwanted occurrence as three higher as you can see. So now in a hydrocarbon industry, what is the best possible way of designing an instrumentation system which can take care of any hazard event? As you can see from this train of events, SIL3 is the best possible integrity level which is used to define an instrumentation system here. So what we do, we define most of our systems in SIL3 terms. But if you define and design the system in seal 3 devices, it becomes very, very costly. So normally a combination of seal 2 and seal 3 devices are used. Now coming back to prevention, protection and mitigation. I'll just digress here and talk about the other prevention and protection methods before I come back to instrumentation once again. How to approach towards prevention, protection and mitigation? We have got standard operating procedures, job safety analysis, disaster management system, and of course, the role of instrumentation in automated prevention and protection systems. Standard operating procedures Standard operating procedures are as you can see, uh, here I have given an example of a furnace lighting up system. This is, uh, as you can see in the table, there are certain activities. In lighting up of a furnace, the different checks which are carried out, the alignment of burners, burner tip thoroughness, ensure that burners are cleaned by mechanical maintenance. These are the activities which are are defined and each of the activities as you can see in the right side we have got three types of people fo is a field operator p 
PO is the panel operator and SIC is the chief in charge. Each has its, its own responsibilities in each of these activities. So now in a hydrocarbon process unit, each type of activity, say a furnace lighting of activity, a column operation, a compressor operation, these are broken down into standard operating procedures like this. And these are strictly followed. If the SOPs are strictly followed, then a hazardous incident will never happen. Or even if a hazardous incident is in the making, it will get averted. So now, now in case of uh, standard operating procedures, it is difficult to cover each and everything through a standard operating procedure. Now, what do we do where something is not covered by a standard operating procedure? There is a method called job safety analysis. Whatever activity is not covered under a standard operating procedure or it is not written down procedure, we have got a system of job safety analysis. What is the job safety analysis? In the job safety analysis, our multidisciplinary team is formed, consisting of mechanical, electrical, instrumentation, process people, fire and safety people. They sit down together and they, again, in a similar to a SOP, they break down the whole of the activity in terms of safety and they discuss and find out what are the mitigative measures that have to be taken if, in a what if scenario, if certain incident happens. So let me give you an example here. An example of JSA, as you can see, the steps of task are broken down. The hazards which can arise because while performing that task are listed down. And to mitigate those hazards, what are the actions that have been taken? The recommended actions are listed and the responsibility is decided. This whole thing is prepared in a standard format like this. Other than the two methods which we have, the standard operating procedure and GSA, if even after that, suppose an incident happens, like we saw in case of the Chevron refinery incident, there is a disaster management system in place which takes care of such an incident. The moment such an incident happens, it goes into action. It takes all mitigation measures, calls in other help from outside, lines of medical measures, ensures containment, evacuation, and finally, restoration of the whole system back into normalcy. The emergencies can be divided into three types of levels. Level 1, Level 2, Level 3. Level 1 and Level 2 are on-site emergencies where Level 1 is an, if an incident happens in a unit and it can be contained in an unit, it's called, called a Level 1 emergency. Level 2 is also an emergency which can contain, maybe not contained within one unit, but it might cover two or three units, but still it can be contained within the installation. And so these are called as on-site emergencies. And level three is the highest level of emergency where it can spread outside of the installation, covering the outside areas also. So it is known as on-site and off-site emergency. Here again, as you can see, there are a different method of dividing into the level and level two emergencies. What are the different incidents which can give rise to level one and level two and level three emergencies? They're given in a tabular form, like oil spills in a flange, pipeline, gate valves, lightning strike, fire in sampling point area, tank overflow, tank collapse. And level three, which can give rise to onset and offset, is something like a pipeline burst, which can cause the gases to spread outside, taking the fire along with it. 
this is the sort of command section which is in place to take care we have got a chief incident controller a site incident controller who are supported by the administration and communication the fire and safety team the operation team and the affected shareholders in our organization this is a list how of the disaster management coordinators similar to that there are fixed responsibilities which are given here We'll go to into an automatic system. I have picked up basically uh, two particular examples to explain how instrumentation plays a big role in mitigation of fires. Here you can see uh, I'm describing a rim seal fire protection system in a tank. Uh, this is a tank, tank storage tank. Uh, this is a storage tank where this is the top of the roof. The top of the roof in a floating roof dam is generally sealed with a rubber material. You see the photograph on the left side. There is a rubber material just beneath this tube which covers the tank. It's a flap type ceiling which prevents any vapors inside from coming out. Now, if this punctures due to some reason, it might cause a small fire to take place on the tank roof, which if not contained, could give rise to a major fire incident. The rim seal protection system consists of three things. It consists of a linear heat detection system, which again consists of a detection evaluation unit, a stainless steel hollow sensor, and an alarm and auto actuation foam disposal system. The detection evaluation unit consists of a stainless hollow sensor tube which is filled with nitrogen and there is a pressure sensor which checks on the rate of rise of temperature and the difference of maximum temperature compared to the rate of rise of temperature. If the, in case of a fire, the rate of rise of temperature is at a higher level above the alarm limit which when detected will cause it to actuate a solenoid valve which will give rise to foam release. See the diagram on the right side. This is a foam release unit which is connected with a tube along a tube flowing through the periphery where there are nozzles at specific strategic places which will feed foam inside the flapper just mitigating the fire. And this is a foam assembly which takes care of the fire which is an automatic actuated valve and it is connected to the direction tube and it, this is fixed to the tank shell. This is installed in all the tanks in our refinery particularly in class A products. Pressure relief and depression systems are also used. Pressure relief system basically consists of pressure relief valves which are fixed on the column tops, vessel tops, and this floats along with the flare system, just dissipating any overpressure gas into the flare system, thus relieving the pressure and keeping the system within control. Now I'm almost at the end of my presentation where we'll talk about fault tolerance systems. This is how a fault tolerance system looks like. A fault tolerance system is a type of logic system which is used in safety shutdown in all the units. In each of the units, we have got a control system and a safety shutdown system. The control system takes care of all control actions. And the safety system takes care whenever a system is in an alarm condition, is in a hazardous condition, it initiates a safety shutdown to bring it to a safe state. Two types of controllers are used in this case, PLC based. One is QMR, one is QMR. QMR is quadruple modular concept. As you can see, there are four processes, quadruple modular concept. 
which are connected with the input modules and the output modules. Output and input modules are dual type. Here is a diagram. As you can see, the middle one, the blue one, these are the processors and beside them are the I.O. modules. We will go down to that next TMR concept. The triple modular concept is a better concept than the quadruple modular concept. As you can see here, we have got three different I.O. modules. The input modules, each input modules has three legs triplicated inputs, these take the inputs and each of these triplicated inputs are fed into separate processors. The processors take the inputs, they are put in a mapped into a table. All the three inputs are then interconnected to the tri bus, they are communicated between the processors. And if the three inputs match, then the processor takes it to be a normal condition and gives the output accordingly based on the control program which is running into the main processor. These voting concepts prevents from the system to give an unsafe action. What happens in if one of the leg fails, the processor will detect a fault in the leg. It will, what it will do, it will take the normal inputs from leg B and leg C, it will get mapped into leg A and it will perform its control function and give the desired output here. The fault will get logged into the system and it will give the operator time to inform to the instrumentation person to make the desired change to replace whatever is the faulty module. Here is a system, the, the first three items, this is the dual power supply at the very left most of the two power supplies, is, it's in dual mode. After the power supplies, we have got three processors, the triplicated processors as you have seen. And after the processors, the communication module, and then we have got the IO modules. The, each of the IO modules are 32 input modules. Each of those channels are triplicated inside the single card is triplicated and which talk with the outside field devices and this talk via a bus beside, behind the system with the processors. These cards can also have a hot spare standby. In case there is a fault in one of the cards, one of the channels, a backup card is pushed into the hot spare standby switchover is done everything is done online in a safe condition and the faulty card is taken out all changes can be done online so in case of safety loops what are the main considerations which we have we have got three types of designs possible nowadays we have got conventional design we have got field bus design and wireless is also there but so far as safety loops is concerned, we always go for conventional. We do not go for communication, we do not go for wireless. The main reason for consideration of safety loops is any device which is being used, any method which is being used, it should have a predictable rate of failure. Unless a system has a predictable rate of failure, if it goes into an unpredictable state, it will give rise to a dangerous situation and that may cause a hazardous fire incident. We must avoid components which might create an unpredictable state. We must avoid components which might create a dangerous state. And failure of a component on loop should cause the system immediately go to a safe state. As we have seen, a fail safe concept. This is how a safety loop looks like. As opposed to a control loop, each of these devices in the safety loop, as I have mentioned before, are either SIL2 or SIL3 devices. The TMR system, which we have seen just now, is a SIL3 device. And the device which is used in the field, here 
as you can see this is an input device the transmitter this is the transmitter the transmitter gives its input through a junction box to a barrier or an isolator which the barrier and isolator the job is to it is an intrinsically safe device and that limits the energy which goes goes out to the field into the transmitter and that takes the signal and gives it to the logic solver here the transmitter is normally a cl2 or a cl3 device and the logic solver is always a cl3 device that brings us to the end of the presentation okay so thanks sujantada for this nice presentation it was really informative and explanatory thanks to audience also for their patience hearing as the time it is short so we'll directly go to the question answer session as that is the most important session for any technical presentation <clears throat> for questions kindly raise your hand by soft keys and wait for your respective terms in case question could not be answered either because of limitation of time or information then the same shall be answered through email in that case kindly put your question and your email id in the chat box we will get back to you as soon as possible now we will go to the individual so if you have any question kindly raise your hand yeah mr siddhartho sen mozumdar he is having question you can directly ask to uh, sushant uh, sushant can you hear me Yes, yes, I can hear you. Oh, let me first thank you for your very enlightening lecture. Uh, uh, I don't have a question, but a queries. Firstly, in the fail-safe system, as you indicated that they use relays, uh, uh, whether whether the hazards to take place and the relay will be in real-time uh, equation or the relay is getting replaced by some other uh, devices and systems. Firstly, a second question is. Uh, in the detection method you told some detection procedure huh, in the last spell of your lecture uh, there is a, some hydrocarbon detection methods as i know are there with the distributed fiber bracketing you may be knowing better so actually they sense in real time uh, the, the the delta shift of the wavelength and that can be very accurately detected whether uh, you were thinking in that line these are the two two queries i have Uh, actually, in reply to your first query, the relays uh, which you are talked about, see, uh, that is one of the methods that are used. Relays uh, are mounted in cabinets inside the control room. Uh, relays basically act as an isolation uh, from the power which comes from the control system, the power which goes to the field. The relay, the contact, it is defined in a phase-safe state in the sense that the relay coil. itself stays continuously energized say uh, we are giving uh, an output to the field to a shutdown valve it is so designed that the relay stays continuously energized the control program is so designed that the relay stays continuously energized and are normally closed contact is used so in case of a failure of an electric failure the relay will get denergized that once the relay gets denergized immediately the shutdown valve will act and it will isolate in the pipeline so okay. this is how a fail safe system is designed i mean okay. uh, as opposed to an electrical system in an electrical system what they do they always take energized to trip the relay normally is in normal condition the coil stays denergized whenever there is a trip a motor is to be tripped the relay gets energized and it gives energy to the field for tripping them okay okay and in the second and case what you have said in the in case of a we do have gas detection system the gas detection systems are also single loops they are not in a communication gas detection gas detectors can be put in a communication bus and it can come to our system but so far as safety is concerned in, for safety systems the gas detectors are taken to two hour two wire or three wire systems and individually they are wired 
No, that's that's right. Basically, uh, objective is to detect in real time and with high sensitivity. Uh, uh, isn't it? So, so 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 devices should be or sensor should be in such a way designed or to be placed so that real time can be detected. Whether your your yeah. devices can detect in real time? Yeah, yeah, real time. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Because what I am saying that the, the fiber back getting they can detect real time and the delta shift in the wavelength and very high high very high highest level of sensitivity. I don't, but this is very costly. Whether that is being employed, I just want to know. We employ two types of detectors. Uh, normally, we use a point detector where if there is a gas leakage, it detects at a particular point. In case of uh, pumps naphtha pumps or pumps like that the detectors are placed very close to the possible leakage source to detect uh, but if the gas moves in a different direction because of wind the detectors cannot sense that so in critical cases we use beam detectors where uh, uh, it has got a path it has got a broader path in a sort of a sector type of thing uh, where it can detect gas leakages when it falls within that sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sushanto. Thank you. Okay, now, now uh, okay, I hope Mr. Siddhartha's query is answered and I will go to Ms. Nandita Rai for her query. Yes. Nandita Rai. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Sushanto Babu? Yes, madam, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I have a simple question. You had just shown in one of the slides that when a petrol in a petrol pump, the tanker comes to fill, the there is a zone one. There is a zone one, there's a zone two, and the white area, which you said is was face, safe area. Now, when the tanker is filling the underground tank, the submerged tank, uh, I, my question is, the hydrocarbons may come out, there could be a leakage in the rim seal, fire protection system, whatever. So there's a hazard already present in the battery of the tanker. But in spite of that, we have the cars waiting outside, the batteries are there. So is there no danger or hazard over there? And the second question, we are generally asked to switch off the cell phones when we are in a petrol pump. The cell phone battery is a small one, very, very small one. So a small battery, how much hazardous can it hazardous can it be? And when there is a car battery, which is a bigger ampere hour, and a truck battery, even a bigger ampere hour. So how hazardous are the situations? Yeah, that's my question. Right, madam. Uh, let me explain one by one. Uh, firstly, when the Normally, a tanker comes into a petrol pump for, for unloading. That time, the petrol dispensers automatically get disabled. You cannot dispense petrol from there. Petrol dispensing is supposed to be absolutely stopped. The area should be cleared off from all vehicles. And at that time, unloading is supposed to be done. We have had incidents if the SOP is not followed otherwise. So when petrol dispensing is going on like this, dispensing in the sense of unloading, not dispensing to the cars, dispensing to the cars is stops, the petroling dispersing units which are there, uh, they are disabled automatically. And the zone one atmosphere when it is formed to prevent any incident from happening, that is why no form of other dispensing is allowed in that area. Secondly, regarding battery, as we have said, uh, mobile, the batteries inside the mobiles, uh, they have been known to explode. There have been incidents of exposure, exposure. So mobiles are told to be turned off when you are inside a petrol pump. We are also not allowed to use mobiles inside the refinery. They are banned because of the same reason. Adam, have I? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Or... Yeah. Okay, thank now... you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
uh, okay now we'll go to the next uh, person the name is not properly fully written uh, kds could you please put forward your question okay i am koshik oh that is koshik koshik ha okay okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry koshik okay it's okay uh thank you shushanduda for this nice lecture and very interesting uh, so i have just one point to ask you that uh, whether uh, in your plan particularly whether there is any possibility for applying uh, robotic system for to mitigate these hazardous situations or not do you have uh, uh, any uh, direction in that way in future because many uh, uh, countries they are using uh, robotic uh, situ- systems uh, maybe it may be arm or it may be different forms uh, to uh, avoid such kind of situation right now the right now no there is no uh, application but as i was talking remember when i went to the department i saw the right. robotic arm so i got an idea you see uh, for hazardous areas Uh, we have uh, seen vessel tops where human intervention could be unsafe there is a very much there is a chance of having robotic applications where certain functions can be performed by robotics uh, a human can stand you know at the bottom of the column away from the vessel and from remotely they can use a robotic arm or robotic hand to perform that function it it's got a very high potential no okay thank you thank you okay any more question from anyone or actually time is already up so i would request if somebody uh, have any question so you can put in the chat box with his email id so that we can continue my name the is session. Uh, hello i'm um, yeah, yeah, i'm ranjan so, ghosh uh i had two basic uh, question one is that it's is a huge subject and very well covered but uh, in the safety and hazards in the plan hydrocarbon plant or any other similar type of plants uh, there are two aspects one is the uh, you know human uh, uh, safety and another is machine safety or plant safety now uh, plant safety is means there are many uh, large rotating machines or any other uh, which can uh, generate um, you know can get into failure mode or uh, and lead to some detection so would the aspects of uh, human hazards and the plant hazards both are normally you know covered in the safety hazard system this is one point so uh, you have you have not much covered on the equipment uh, hazards or plant hazards which can lead to uh, human hazard also and another is see another thing is that today as uh, the lady is someone was someone was talking about the no not the lady someone was talking about the real time um, you know detection and the relays are not really proper this thing in, in inside the control room of course yes but there is uh, many uh, you know field uh, e- e- equipments uh, where uh, if the relays are used in an uh, intrinsically safe and exclusion group and closures and all this then um, there are uh, there may be some problems can come in and uh, so these days you know across the plants uh, iot sensors are used uh, and networks are used uh, deploying iot sensors throughout the plant to monitor various parameters such as temperature pressure and other uh, parameters allowing a real time collection of data analysis and that uh, leads to predictive maintenance you know ai powered predictive maintenance systems 
can analyze the sensor data to detect potential equipment failures or corrosion issues as happened in the, the video you have shown analyze sensor data to uh, detect those potential equipment failures corrosion and others before they escalate into safety hazards enabling proactive maintenance so these days people are going to towards the iot sensors and the uh, ai ml based uh, analysis to get to the predictive maintenance issues and even uh, machine learning and anomaly detections are also employed basically and gas detection systems are same you know like ai enabled if it comes to ai enabled systems then the detection of gas and uh, analyze the leaks promptly real in real time triggering alarms and emergency response procedures to protect personnel and neighboring communities also so uh, that's what i was telling they, this is a second point and there are many uh, things is a big subject of course i can understand and one very very important thing which uh, needs to be emphasized is that training you know training of uh, personnel on the, uh, the uh, on the safety issues and all these so uh, even to these days the um, experiments are going on uh, to create uh, digital twins actually creating the digital replica of the entire process plant and simulating various scenario scenarios to identify potential safety hazards and optimize safety measures uh, these are used for um, the intensive trainings of people basically so uh, there are some points i just wanted to clear thank you thank you ranjanda for uh, the ins- insights that you have given uh, let me explain on some of the points actually uh, i uh, prepared the presentation with uh, complete focus on uh, human safety because here mm-hmm. i wanted to cover uh, specifically human hazards mm-hmm. human safety because loss of human life is most important and yeah. uh, there is of course machine safety is uh, again a separate subject altogether so uh, in the time which which was given to me <laughs> this itself was more than yeah i now. understand right so machine safety i have not covered i have in fact i have not got gone into it at all whatever even uh, the logic solvers which i have shown here they also take care of machine safety but i have totally you know uh, considered on human safety and regarding iiot uh, we have uh, as we have rightly pointed out uh, we have applications uh, which are using for corrosion monitoring we are using iiot application uh, we have uh, got monitoring of uh, wireless monitoring of vessels for corrosion for pipelines we have installed systems uh, from emerson with which we monitor okay. through iiot based and iiot applications were using for collecting data operating data they are using uh, smart tablets through which iot based uh, data is collected and uh, in case of uh, attending emergencies the fire and safety personnel they have got smart helmets with which they can connect remotely to anywhere even to our head office safety department who can guide them uh, they can in fact directly see through the smart helmet the actual incident which is happening there at site so iit is very much in use but so far as uh, the safety shutdown system is concerned we believe strongly believe that conventional system is best and so we keep any form of communication out of it because you see in communication there is always a chance of something going into an unpredictable state and we are always opposed to something going to an unpredictable state it is better to have a device which has got a predictable rate of failure we know that when it fails it will fail into a certain safe state yeah yeah i just wanted to uh, tell that you see device and the plant safety and the machine shape safety i have seen uh, in my life also uh, that uh, the uh, 
मशीन हेजर्ड्स लीड्स टू ए बिगर फायर और बिगर एंड स्पेशली वन यू हैंडल फ्लूड्स लाइक एलपीजी व्हिच इज लाइटर देन द एयर इट सेटल्स डाउन एंड यू यू विल नो फॉर अदर्स आल्सो लेट मी टेल यू दैट द एलपीजी as a hazardous material can go to a huge extent for uh, you know once it uh, in the um, there's a condition called blevy which uh, leads to the uh, the fire uh, moves like a fireball in the, the, there are cotton spheres like spherical uh, tanks for the lpg uh, uh, storage which uh, if uh, something happens some hazard takes place and fire uh, spreads out then it can you know the fireball big fireballs can travel at a very very high speed to uh, maybe the, you know a kilometer or so so those are very very so that's why uh, these days uh, the you know as we know that uh, the preventive maintenance uh, procedures has led down to the predictive maintenance uh, so so the analysis real time data collection and analysis of those data and then um, in advance predict, predicting the um, occurrence of hazard, hazard situations which has not happened till that till that time uh, and, four alarm is given so that necessary actions can be taken to prevent those um, hazard conditions and the explosive conditions thank you sir do you have any further questions no i think uh, our time is already over uh, so uh, so and there are no no more raised hand also so let us conclude the session here and thanks once again to all it was really in informative and interactive session hope all of us has enjoyed this enjoyed this session wish you a nice evening stay well and stay safe until we meet next time okay thank you goodbye goodbye all thank thank you thank you then bye see you thank you I'm